Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Richard Bangle. I'm a cardiac surgery and critical care physician assistant at Virtua Lady of Lords in Camden, New Jersey. And today we're going to talk about the clinical application of HPI. Just a disclosure, I'm Ricky Bengal. This is a paid consultant for Everyday Life Sciences. And uh, let's get started. So this is our screen. This is our Hemosphere screen. This is going to be the user interface that you're actually going to see when you hook your arterial line up to the uh, Hemosphere. And these numbers here are the hemodynamic numbers that we're familiar with from uh, using other monitoring devices, such as a Swan GANS. And up in the right-hand corner here, this is your HPI. Uh, this is your uh, hypotensive predictive index, a scale of 1 to 100. Uh, closer you get to 100, like Dr. Scott said, the likelihood of hypotension increases. Uh, down here are your cerebral sacs uh, and your tissue oximetry. We're not really going to talk too much about this uh, today, but this is interesting stuff to talk about. And then you have your... Um, your trend data here. These lines here are uh, just the trend of what's been going on with the patient. These are live updating. These are your actual live numbers, what's going on currently with your patient. And this is all customizable. You can put whatever uh, variables you would like here. If you would rather use cardiac index instead of cardiac output or show volume variability, uh, this, is a, this can all be changed. And for uh, discussion purposes, we're going to define hypotension as a map less than 65 for one minute. Looking at these screens again, this is the original screen that I showed you without the red circle there. So same number, same uh, hypotensive predictive index here. And what we're going to see is these trends. And we're going to see this HPI rise. And it's going to rise and fall just like we see our, our MAP, our SVR, stroke volume. But what's going to happen is as the HPI approaches 85 twice or above 90, what we're going to see is this alert screen pop up. And you can touch the button touch screen. You can acknowledge this and continue on your course of action, or we can click this more information button. And what it's going to do is it's going to take us to a secondary screen. Our secondary screen is this. This is a simulated screen. This is not the same. However, this is exactly what you're going to see on your device. And what it's going to do is it's going to break down the factors of hypotension. So what we can see here is a HPI of 86. You can see our map is 75. We've got two, two arms of this decision tree. Let's go to the simple one first, your SVR. This is your after allergic systemic vascular resistance. We can see here about, uh, it's about 1,700. And then when we go down to the left side here in this yellow box, you see your cardiac output of 3.5. Going down into the factors of that, you see your pulse rate, you see your stroke volume, and then your factors, your stroke volume, your stroke volume variability, your DPDT, uh, which is your contractility, and your EA dime, which is your dynamic elasticity of your arterials. And what we can see here is nice color coded for us to tell us what the problem is. Um, but this is going to give us a bigger picture of what's going on with our patient other than what we're currently seeing. And what we can also do here is we can trend the data. And this is a percent change, so 20% down here in MAP, 34 down here in cardiac output, uh, SVR increased 23%, and this is all over five minutes. So we can change all this, but this is a good trend line to see where our patient's going. Of note, since we're talking about functions of the screen itself, what we're able to do is we're able to implant interventions. So when we do something like start a presser or give a fluid bolus or give blood or a, a vasodilator, what we can do is we can click this button here. It will implant one of these, and we can actually implant what we did to the patient there, and we can see the trend lines after we did that. So let's take a look at what we did to this patient here that caused this dramatic rise in SVR. Um, that didn't really affect our cardiac index or our stroke volume all that much. This patient was started on neosynephrine. So we got the appropriate response in SVR, which we saw was 500 on the last page, and this is what we're able to do for all of our interventions. Let's talk about some cases now. Uh, we're going to talk about two cases. Uh, this first case here, we're going to talk about the operating room and continuum of care into the ICU, and the second one is going to be more of a simulation. So. Let's get started. This is a 73-year-old female, past medical history, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, TIAs, four stents in the past, and an ejection fraction of 35 to 40%. She uh, underwent a cabbage times three. And uh, after the case, what we do is we download our data and we put it into the Acumen Analytics software. And this is our first page. This is our summary page. This is the first page you're going to look at. In the upper left-hand corner here, this is just demographics about the patient. This is the date of the surgery, weight, age, female. Uh, on the bottom right-hand corner, this is usually what I look at first uh, as far as our hemodynamics uh, during the case. So you see our procedure time is 1,600 minutes. It's about 24 hours, so you can tell there 
Uh, that's the case plus the ICU length of stay, uh, or I'm sorry, the ICU time that we had the hemisphere on. You can see 161 of those 1,600 minutes was hypotension. That's about 10% of our time. It's not bad, but not very good. And then what we're able to do over here is we're able to break down those uh, statistics a little bit more. And what we see here is a uh, map of under 50. We have no events there, so that's pretty good. And we see an average map of 61. That's not that bad. And then we look at our average hypotensive times. So meaning that every time that we were hypotensive, how long did it take for us to get back to a normal tensive state? And we see here about six, six seven minutes. And like I said, this box here is usually the first one I look at. This really gives you an idea of how hypotensive that patient was. Because we know every minute of hypotension really makes a difference in a lot of patients. What we're able to do from the Acumen Analytics then is uh, we're able to do a trend analysis. So what we're able to do is we're able to look at all of our factors, the same ones on our, on our secondary screen on the hemisphere. We're able to look at uh, through a retrospectoscope uh, to say and look at what happened during the case and during the ICU. And so let's just talk about what we're looking at here. So we're looking at the map and we're looking at the HPI on the screen. On the next couple screens, we're going to look at the uh, SVR, the SVB, the cardiac index. We're going to look at a bunch of other things. And uh, this blue line here is our uh, delineation between the OR and the ICU. And this break here is the time that we were on pump and we paused the device. And then what we see uh, here are these two blue arrows on each of these graphs. These are going to be interventions. So let's take a look at what we did here. In the operating room, it looks like we had uh, a pretty decent control of our map. We, looks like we don't become really hypotensive all that much. A couple little blips here, but overall okay. And we look to see our correlation with our HPI. And what we can see here is you see the HPI did alarm quite a few times, but this patient was treated appropriately, it looks like. We never actually became hypotensive, so that's a good thing. But then let's look at what goes on over here. Our, our HPI kind of goes up and our map goes up, so we did something here. So let's take a look at what we did. And we added Levofed here. So we started a presser for this HPI that was alarming here, and our map responded appropriately. But we see that we never really recovered. We see that our HPI still stays pretty high, and we're looking at our map that's staying below our 65. It's yellow and red here. It looks like we're still hypotensive, but it looks like we did something else. So let's take a look at what we did here. And we added a, a second presser. We doubled down on what we thought the appropriate treatment was, and we can see that we never really got that much better until much later we see that we finally get a map that's better. So let's look at our other, our other uh, parameters and see maybe if we could have done something a little bit better here. So now we're looking at our cardiac index, our stroke volume, and our uh, systemic vascular resistance. And we can see here that we know that we really didn't become all that hypotensive in the operating room. Look, we had a stroke volume that was kind of low kind of the whole time, and our SDR was kind of high the whole time. This picture might have been a little bit dry coming into the operating room. You know, we, we're talking about a cabbage. So we're talking about people who might be diuresis before surgery, MPO at midnight. Maybe this person could have used a little bit of fluids early on. But then we see this instability here. And we really see it after this initiation of our levofed. We see our index severely suffer. We increased our, our stroke volume. So, or, I'm sorry. We increased our systemic vascular resistance, our afterload, so much that it actually decreased our hemodynamics. Although it treated our MAP, it wasn't necessarily the best treatment for our patient hemodynamics. And we can see that when we doubled down with our second presser, we kind of had the same problem. Our index still hangs out around two, which is marginally acceptable. And our SVR hangs out around 2,000, which is not really what we're looking for. But we see our stroke volume kind of increase. So it looks like we finally got on the right page here with we need to come off the presser, we need to give some volume. And you see that uh, through the increase in the stroke volume here. The overall outcome of this patient, um, not terrible, but not exactly our goal either. We had an ICU length of stay of five days. We did not experience an AKI in this patient. We had an overall length of stay of eight days. She was discharged home. Uh, but let's really talk about the complication of this, of this course, where she remained on presses for about 48 hours after surgery. And for those of you who do cardiac surgery critical care, you know that the beta blocker initiation is a big part of post cabbage. And while you're on presser, you're really not going to start that beta blocker. So that's going to add delay to our length of stay. And oxygenation issues after eventually giving volume is going to lead to, you know, supplemental oxygen needs. So that's kind of what held up her course. Not bad, but probably could have been better. 
Let's talk about a second case here. This is a 49-year-old male with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia. He's an active smoker. He underwent a robotic-assisted off-pump cabbage times one. And uh, this is going to be just the operating room, and we're going to do more of a simulation. But let's take a look at his Acumen Analytic page first. We see here, again, his, this is his, uh, just his demographics. We look down here in the bottom right-hand corner, normally where I go next, is 137-minute case, 26 minutes of hypotension, just about 19% of hypotension during that time. You know, overall, fast case, not a lot of minutes of hypotension, high percentage, but relatively pretty good there. Again, MAP under 50, none of those. Average MAP under 65, 59, not so bad. And then it looks like we treated our hypotension pretty quickly here with only, you know, the average duration of events were about, uh, you know, three minutes, uh, less than three minutes. So treated, treated very quickly. But let's get into the simulation a little bit. And let's talk about what we're looking about on this screen. So the big screen here with our EKG and arterial waveform, our SATs and our this is normally what's going to be on your monitor in the ICU or the operating room. And this littler screen here is going to be your hemisphere. And this is exactly what you're going to see on your screen, although this is a simulation. This is exactly what you're going to see. And what you see here is your HPI 35. You got your MAP, your cardiac index, stroke volume, stroke volume variation, your DPDT, your contractility, your EA dying, volume responsiveness, and your SVR, your afterload. And I know Dr. Scott uh, just got, went through those parameters with you, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about what all those mean. But what we can see here is you see a live EKG like you normally would, and you can see that this is live too. This is going to be our trend data, and that's going to move depending on what's going on with this patient. We can see here that you know your stroke volume variability is up a little bit. Stroke volume is okay. All these other numbers look great, and your HPI is 35, very low. Very low chance of becoming hypotensive very soon. But let's speed this up a little bit, and let's see what happens to this patient. We see the HPI kind of goes up to 50 here, but let's look at some of the other parameters here. We see our map is kind of the same. Our index is good. Our short volume is rising. We see our HPI click up there to 69. So now we know that you know hypotension is kind of getting closer to us, and we should really start paying attention to this patient, but there's not much to do because the map is 74. Here we see we're above 85 for the first time, so there's no, uh, there's no warning screen that comes up. You see our stroke volume variability increasing. SVR is still okay. Stroke volume is now down to 66. So we're looking at maybe a little bit of, of uh, hypovolemia. And now we're above 95. So here is our alert that comes up. And we can either acknowledge this and continue on our course of action, or we can click more information. We're going to click more information here. And when we click more information, it's going to take us to our secondary screen. And our sec secondary screen here is uh, breaking it down. So our MAP 69, it's down 17% in five minutes. Our short volume variability is up 33% in five minutes. We see all of our other numbers look okay. Our, our EA dying, you know, volume responsive, probably what this patient's going to need. And what we're going to see is an intervention be done. And what we see is our provider leaves that screen and is going to click this button and it's going to pull up an intervention screen. And this provider here picks a vasopressor. So we have our, our arrow here that says we started something. And we can see what happens after that. So we gave a bolus of levofed here. And our HPI is still high because we kind of decided that maybe we need a little bit of volume at first. So we see that our MAP is still 73. We did not become hypotensive. But because of our, our actions, we've decreased our cardiac index. And our short volume variability is now very high, and our short volume is now very low, and our SVR is high. So this all makes sense knowing that you know increased afterload and a decreased preload is going to drop down our cardiac index. You see our HPI drop because we're not going to become hypotensive soon unless we really treat these things. So what we're going to see is this bolus of pressor wear off, and our, our hemodynamics are really suffering now, index of 1.6, short volume is very low, SVR is very high. And what we're going to see is the HPI quickly comes back up because we never actually treated the problem. So we're at 31 here, and then 44, and then 63, 75, 93. Here we are. We're back into the 90s, and we see is now we're actually hypotensive. Our index is okay. Our short volume is low. Our SVB is high. We're going to do is click more information again, and we're looking at the same, same secondary screen here, MAP67. 
and we see our shoreline variability is now 18, and our shoreline is 56, and we're now going to treat these numbers, and our provider is going to pick an intervention. So the provider picks an intervention. This time we're going to pick crystalloid, and we're going to see if that's the appropriate response uh, to volume that this patient's going to have in the HPI. So the volume goes in and quickly the HPI comes down. The MAP quickly increases. Your cardiac index is now 2.4. And we're going to skip ahead a little bit here. You see your HPI come down now to 29, the lowest it's been during this case. Our MAP is 71. Our index is great. We have a, a lowering stroke line variation. And our SVR is now acceptable. And if we continue to move along here, we see that this patient really stabilizes and we don't really have another uh, event of hypotension because we actually treated this patient appropriately with that volume. You see that short volume variation really coming down now. Oops, sorry, let's get back on me. We see the short volume variation now down to 15 and eventually 12. And we look good. We have a map at 81, our HPI is 28, index is 2.5. This is a patient who's going to do well. So let's talk about how this patient overall did. Let's talk about the overall outcomes. And uh, so this case, uh, this patient did well. They excavated in the operating room, ICU length of stay of one day, three-day hospital course, discharge home, no complications. This is our goal from uh, robotic cardiac surgery. So talking about uh, COVID-19 discussion, um, in the beginning of COVID-19, there was not a lot of direction on the treatment on how to treat these patients with a lot of supportive care. And we found that by sticking the hemisphere on some patients and really getting a good idea of what's going on uh, from the hemodynamics, we were able to better manage their fluids and their pressure status. In the beginning, we really were reluctant to give any volume because of how hypoxic they were. We didn't want to flood their lungs and make their restore status worse. Uh, so we, were, we didn't give a lot of volume. We were riding a lot of pressure. And what we found when we put the hemosphere on our patients, we started to see that they were a little bit too dry. And we started giving some volume and some pressure use, obviously. I mean, it is a septic picture, so, so you're going to need both. But really, we had some goal-directed fluid therapy. And I thought that that was uh, a big turning point for, for us in the ICU. Um, that's really the topics one and two combined. They kind of play off of each other. Topic number three there, you know, the high output cardiogenic shock. You know, you have your septic shock, which is your high output cardiogenic shock high output shock, and you add that on top of people who are a little bit older, maybe some undiagnosed coronary artery disease or valvular disease, and then even a viral cardiomyopathy, um, you had to take all this into consideration when treating these patients and what you were going to choose to raise their blood pressure or give them volume. And by using, you know, DPDT, we were able to use this as a trend to treat uh, the hemodynamics a little bit more in a scientific manner instead of throwing the kitchen sink and hoping something would work. And then the last topic there, the tissue oximetry. You know, in one of the earlier slides in this presentation, we talked a little bit about the cerebral sats and the, and the limb sats. Uh, this was uh, a good trend for our patients to see how they were doing. You know, in a typical picture, you have a low tissue oximetry and because your body's up taking that oxygen and using it. And then we would see that it would kind of uptrend and hang out around 100 if our body wasn't uptake, uptaking any oxygen. And we used the tissue oxygen to really guide our care and escalation and de-escalation uh, of what we were doing for a lot of these people. And, and these, these topics are really what we thought uh, were the biggest discussion points in our ICU using the hemosphere. Uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate uh, being able to speak with you all, and I'd like to open up the floor to some Q&A. Thanks again.